Welcome to our very first episode podcast of Chicago Forward, shining a spotlight on Chicago leaders and innovators here in the city of Chicago. And we have a very special guest in the house with us today. She is CEO and founder of Chicago Beyond, Mrs. Liz Dozier. Mrs. Liz, how are you doing? I know you say call you Liz, but I'm so used to putting Mrs. Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Beyond in front of it. So bear with me with that. All good. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited I get to be the first. You know what I mean? This is like, I feel like I'm breaking new ground and territory here. This is <laughs> amazing. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And then alongside to your left, we got the executive producer, great friend of mine, Brian. Brian, how's it going? Going great. It's exciting to have our first show together, Antoine. Hopefully many more to come. Yes, hopefully so, man. Let's let's make sure we do this right and have some fun and uh inform the people about some wonderful things that are going on here in the city of Chicago and the people that are doing the things that make the city what it is. So very first question, Liz, I got a chance to read up on you. Um, you have you have had a very amazing journey, not only in your mm-hmm. life, but uh, just working with the city of Chicago. Um, I was a student at Orr High School back during your time when you were working at Finger High School. Yeah. And, so I, I know your story. It was, it was nationwide. It was something that was that was very big here in the city. Um, I want to know, uh, starting off, uh, your transition from educator to activist. Um, how did that transition come along and what was the motivation behind it? Yeah, I don't know if there was ever like a specific point, if you will, of like educator to activist. Like, I, I think that, you know, the way I grew up, my mom, um, and this, you know, story is public. I've talked about it before, but, you know, my dad, my mom met under very interesting circumstances. My dad was actually, um, you know, being held at at Cook County Jail. Uh, He was awaiting a trial. My mom was actually a nun who was uh, essentially ministering to folks in prison. She was also teaching folks how to read. And so um, that's how my parents met. Uh, Long story short, 10 years later, my mom left the convent. She had me. Um, and so like this, this idea of um, being really aware of what's happening in the world and what's happening around me and realizing that you know, there are a lot of injustices that are happening in the world. I learned that from like a very, very early age. It was just part of like conversation in my household growing up. And so, um, you know, my mom also was a teacher. And so education was a big thing in, in our house as well. Um, that we, you know, didn't grow up by with, you know, uh, a lot, if you will, but education was always like prioritized in, in our home. And so I think that the combination of just like understanding some of the social realities, but also understanding the importance of education made for the backdrop of what my life and career has really been dedicated to. You know, I saw, you know, firsthand with my dad, my dad's an incredibly, if you met him, like he's, he's just brilliant. He's one of the kindest, smartest people that you'd ever want to meet yet you know, he is not a functional reader. You know, my dad's 70 something years old now, but can't, cannot read. And I, I just saw, again, up front and center of the injustices of the system. And so always, you know, from really early age, wanted to do something about it. And so, you know, hence, like, here we are. I met you, Liz, when you were uh, the turn, you had taken over and the turnaround process was going, right? And you took over Fanger High School at a challenging time when the dr- when I think, uh, you know, what 19%, uh, yeah, 19%, uh, I, I, the statistics, you move the statistics greatly. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that period of your life. And obviously you became somewhat of a celebrity because of the Chicago Land <laughs> series, but really delving into that turnaround process, because it was quite co- controversial at the time, but it seemed to work for Fanger. Uh, so I'd love to have your thoughts on that period of your life. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I just want to say just on a, on a personal note, thank you for being so supportive during that time, Brian. Like I uh, will never forget like how uh, kind you were during that time and how supportive you were to us and to the kids, whether it was, you know, connecting us with particular reporters to get our story out or just showing up uh, and being really present. And, you know, anyone who's been through, uh, 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 you know, a traumatic situation, which at times, like the, because of what we were facing at Finger, it was really traumatic. It was, it's good just to have support. And so just thank you again oh, for man. all that you did during that time. My heart broke for you in that, uh, as you know, with Darian Albert's tragic death. 
and then and then the media was its worst yeah. self at that time. Uh, yeah, it was. It was both the best and the worst of the media, though, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it was a wild time. Um, you, know, the turnaround process itself was is is interesting. You know, like looking back on it now, the Finger High School, just for context for the audience, went through the turnaround process. I put that in in air quotes uh, in two thousand nine. And so this is, you know, we're now talking about over a decade ago. And so as, as I look back on it, there's like, you know, some incredible things about, you know, that happened specifically with, you know, Finger High School and with its turnaround, you know, whether it's, you know, doubling our state graduation rate from 40% to over 80% or um, you know, dropout rate going down from 20% to down below 2%. There were the great things that were happening um, at the school. But yet it, it's, a, it's a really challenging process. And one that, you know, as I reflect back on it is um, um, it's just, I think what the right words are here. It is, it is traumatic and it is, um, I think sometimes even somewhat unnecessary um, in the way that it was executed. So just for context for the audience, you know, the turnaround process essentially takes, you know, all the adults who are within the school building, essentially lets all of those people go and brings an entirely new staff. And some of those, you know, a few of those team members are still retained, but we're talking about, you know, usually like less than 5%. And it, it just really rips apart uh, community. And it rips apart um, some of the fabric that in relationships that hold a school together, that make a school a school, that make it a safe place for kids. And so, you know, there are definitely, I think, good aspects uh, and good intentions behind turnaround. But often I think it can be really, really challenging. Uh, so Chicago was, you know, big in the turnaround movement, you know, about a decade or so ago, but has since like transitioned from that. And I can I can see both the pros and the cons to, to why that was done. You know, our turnaround process was interesting in that, you know, that, that very same sort of starting point was what happened at Finger, right? Everyone was let go, a new staff was brought in. Um, but what I quickly learned as the principal was that, you know, there was a lot of institutional knowledge, a lot of relationships that were shattered because of that. And so really the bulk of that first couple of years of my time at Finger and my team's time at Finger, which is reestablishing that really important fabric of relationships and knowing families and knowing community and knowing what kids were up against and really meeting their needs, um, wherever, wherever that would be, whether that was for, you know, social emotional supports, trauma counseling, um, you know, making sure that we had, you know, the sports and activities that, you know, adults understood like cultural competency and context and all those things. Like we spent a lot of time just rebuilding essentially with the turnaround, you know, tore apart. And once yeah. we did that, then we were able to get into some of the, you know, the nuances of like, you know, education and, you know, test scores and all those types of things. But it, it definitely, that process was, uh, if nothing else, it was it was challenging. Well, kudos to you for all the work that you've done with Finger and just hearing about that process. Um, my question for you with that would be, what was the most rewarding aspect of, um, obviously you dealt with a lot of hardship being able to just like deal with the, not only the media that came with everything, of, uh, with the turnaround, the students, the parents, the community, what was the the shining light for you through all of the chaos? My favorite part of all of that was my kids, my students. You know, I really enjoyed my relationships with my students. Like it, you know, it's it's such a privilege and an honor to be a principal, to be charged with essentially stewarding young people at a very critical point of their life. Like I always think of, you know, high school as this like this time of um, just setting the stage for a young person's life. You know, mm -hmm. there are going to be some really critical decisions that young people are making during that time period that are going to essentially impact the rest of their life in in some form or fashion. And so it's such a, it's such an honor and a privilege to be a part of that. And it's just such an honor and a privilege to actually watch students grow. Like I mean all of us have been through high school. We, you know, we work with high school students. Like, you know, you see a student come in in ninth grade and everyone's sort of like awkward and trying to get their selves together. And you got someone who's like four feet tall and someone who's like six feet tall and they're all in like in ninth grade, it's like this thing, you know, and they're trying to figure themselves out. 
And then to be able to watch that transition, you know, and had have a relationship with a child like through ninth through 12th grade and beyond and see them grow is just, um, I, I, I don't know what else to say other than it's a privilege and an honor. And it was you know, really, for me, it was the best part of being a principal of like walking through the hallways and knowing student stories and knowing their families. It, it was the relational piece um, that was always the, the, the highlight and the best part of it for me. And it's honestly what kept me in it for as long as I stayed. I was at Finger for six years. Um, I was never a fan of the politics. I was never a fan of a lot of the red tape and minutia and all those things. But you know, it, it truly was the young people that just literally lit me up in so many ways. And in a lot of ways became like a family for me. I didn't, my family's, uh, my situation growing up was, um, you know, there's a lot of not so great things that happened uh, growing up and in my, and in, and in my home. And in a lot of ways, being a part of Finger felt like the family that I had always wanted. You know, it was like, it was like, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was, it, it just, it just was, I don't know how else to describe it, but it just was. And so it was, it was a privilege and honor to lead the school for as long as I did. I, yeah, I just walking those halls and seeing, and, and then seeing our friend AJ do work yeah. with you, AJ Johnson, who ran your Peace Council, and yeah, there was a, there was a sense of family on your staff that was really that the students picked up on, and you know, just a sense of caring that when you walked into the doors. Um, yeah, I used to say, it wasn't perfect, you know, like I always say, like nothing's perfect, you know, so. We definitely had our challenges and all the things, but at the end of the day, there were a lot of people at Fanger, um, parents, students, teacher, the, all of us that like really cared a lot about one another and cared a lot about, you know, making our school community bright and making it beautiful and making it a safe place to be. And I think that's the story that doesn't get told oftentimes when people cast a certain um, you know, narrative out in the world about our schools, particularly when it comes to black and brown schools, particularly when it comes to black and brown schools in urban areas, there's this narrative cast, like, you know, the parents don't care and the kids don't care and the teachers don't care and all this. And it, it's really not true. Um, and that na narrative propagates, um, as the, I believe the undertone of it is oftentimes racism, um, but it, it, it propagates a lot of things um, out in the world that are, are false. So... Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of fascinating how you can walk into a school and in the first five minutes, your interactions with the administrative staff, with the security staff, tell you so much about the school. Mm -hmm. uh, you almost don't even have to go in a classroom to know if, if how the school is doing. Um, yeah, very true. Yeah. You, let's switch a little bit to your current work now, because I think, you know, you were a revolutionary, you are a revolutionary educator, but now I think you're, you're a revolutionary philanthropist. And I love some of the things you put out. Uh, you know, why, why am I always being researched that, uh, that document about black and brown folks getting perpetually researched and the research industrial complex, extracting money and, 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 and studying people is solving other people's problems sometimes, right? Uh, so I, I thought that was brilliant, but I wanted to drill down. I think your your main platform now is whole philanthropy. Uh, and uh, I love the how you put it together. And I also kind of enjoy the critique under the surface of current philanthropy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was hoping to kind of, I went to the, like, the, the, the details uh, on page like 16 to 20 of your report. And uh, there are six items that you talk about the details behind impact, philo impact uh, philosophy. And I'll, I'll read a couple and then just love for you to kind of delve a little deeper into it. And then uh, so maybe we'll take the first three here and then the last three you have to deal with measurement. But your first one is prioritize what's important instead of searching for the perfect answer. And I circled the word perfect on there because I thought that was a critique of, of, uh, of uh, as well, focus on key questions over easy metrics. And I circled easy metrics there because mm -hmm. I think so much of what we fail to do is, is because of those easy, trying to find easy metrics and then center voices closest to the work. Uh, could you delve into those three 
philosophies and, and I'm in love with them. So I, I'm already persuaded, but I just want to hear how that's working yeah. out. Here. And how has the philanthropy community taken this not so subtle critique? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. So I'll, I'll back up to why am I always being researched? I think it's a really important point that, um, is just now because of the last two years and what's happened in the last two years in the world, um, beginning to actually get, um, you know, some, some light shine on it. But, but it's this idea of, if particularly with research, um, and you see this a lot of times, I think out of the University of Chicago Urban Labs, particularly the, the, the crime education lab, it's this premise of an idea that, you know, Black people need to be somehow solved or that poor people need to be solved, or that community needs to be solved. And it doesn't really account for what are the underlying drive drivers of why communities are in the particular situation that they're in? Why does violence you know, in communities, why does it exist the way it does? And it, it, it pits really, particularly black people and brown people as like problematic. And mm -hmm. which, which, is, it's, which is for all the reasons we know is, 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 is not right. And so it was really important. It was, so we, we see research usually as like a, a, a driver under that uh, philosophy, whether it's um, direct or indirect and some of, some of the, the tone. Um, and so it was important for us to publish Why Am I Always Being Researched? Because we saw that same thing popping up in philanthropy where there was, I'll actually tell you a story of how we came up with the name. Um, there was a young man who... Uh, was in, in Lawndale and there was a study being conducted by the University of Chicago. Actually, Chicago Beyond at the time was funding. And uh, the young man who's actually on the cover of Why Am I Always Being Researched, um, oh, yeah. he said to the researcher, as like an assistant researcher person, he it was the most genuine question ever. He had to sign off on a form to, to participate in a research study for the program that he was in. And he was, I think, like, at the time, like 19, 20 years old. And he asked the most genuine question. He said, he said to the research assistant, he was like, you know, he said, I still understand. He's like, can you help me understand this? He's like, I I've signed off on a couple of these forms over the last couple of years to consent to be a part of a research study. And he was like, you know, I sign off on these things. And I don't understand what happens. Like, wh what, why, why, why am I always being researched? Why is my community always being researched? And what really comes of it? Um, so we had, you know, really taken that question to heart of like, you know, what, what actually does need to be researched and, and, and why? Um, and why are we positioning our communities and particularly black people as like problems that need to be solved? And so hence we published uh, Why Am I Always Being Researched Out Into the World? It was as much of a letter to ourselves about how we need to show up when it comes to like funding research and supporting some of these causes as it was a call for others to really think about how they conduct research. And so we put it out in the world and long story super short, it's gotten picked up by the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation. It's actually, they're using it to guide their K through 12 research guidelines oh, here yeah. in the U.S. Like it's, be, it's been picked up in um, uh, a particular project uh, in a part of Africa that is researching child soldiers. Um, like it's just, it's, 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 it's kind of taken on legs of its own. And our hope to your point, Brian, around hope philanthropy was that this was like almost like a part two, a really challenging ourselves, you know, at Chicago Beyond. How do we show up in this, in how do we show up in this work of philanthropy in ways that are conscious, in ways that are connected, and in ways that are really rooted in solidarity, and not in some way of like, you know, giving someone some pittance of something and they expect to be patted on the back. But how do we show up and link arms with uh, organizations, with institutions, with people, um, with the idea that each of us brings something powerful to the table and we're better together and there's and, and to obliterate that power dynamic that exists in philanthropy. Um, so when you talk about that first one, you know, how should we measure in, in you know, impact, you know, you know, prioritizing like what's important instead of searching for the perfect answer. I think, you know, we need to look no farther sometimes in the research happening in our, in our own backyard as we mm -hmm. think about, um, you know, why is it that we have to, you know, participate 
in, you know, why are we spending like tens of millions of dollars on research when actually the answers are already out there? Actually, a community can tell you what it needs. Actually, like we've done, you know, these studies. And so we don't need to have like the perfect randomized control trial answer to tell us like what to do. And, amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, we just don't, you know, and that there, and I think that we have to admit that there is this propensity to have you know, someone in academia val validate um, what community knows to already be true. And we just waste a lot of money, a lot of time. And there's a whole co industrial complex behind it that we are supporting. That's not we healthy. We find out like, well, caring adults matter. <laughs> like some of this stuff, I swear to God, I, I, I promise you, like, I'll be reading this. And I'm like, I could have, we spent $20 million on this. I know nine people like in Rosen who could have given you that answer in 20 minutes or less for free. Like we don't need to spend money. And it, 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 it's, it's like, it's almost like whose voice really matters. You know, we need, we need to spend $20 million to have someone with a particular set of degrees tell us something when actually no, the people most impacted can actually give us what the answers are, you know? Um, yeah. That's just my, this is my two cents. No, I'm, I'm so in your corner. Uh, Antoine, do you remember studying, getting studied a lot at OR? Yeah, that too. And and you you made you hit the nail right on the head, uh, Liz. I mean, it's this is this is a these are conversations that happen in every barbershop, in every school, in every playground, at every at, at every urban establishment. About if you really want to know what the problem is, if you really want to get to the root causes of why things are in certain communities here in the city, ask the people. Yeah. Ask the people. Re actually go into the neighborhoods, talk to them, really figure out what are some of the struggles that that these people deal with on a day-in and day-out basis. But I have one question for you, because this is because your your like I said, your your transition from educator principal to philanthropist like how how has that transition um been for you and do you feel like some of the skills that you've um garnered as a principal at finger how has it helped you become uh such a fantastic philanthropist um in the field that you're doing now yeah i don't know if i'm fantastic i think that i'm trying i think like all of us you know like i'm 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 trying to do the best that I can do in the role Liz, that I'm giving you your roses. We, we, we're giving you your roses, okay? <laughs> you know, no one's, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be clear, you know, like we, I, Chicago Beyond, I, Liz Dozier, like we've, I've made mistakes along the way. You know, a lot of, you know, when we first started Chicago Beyond, we invested in a lot of research. Like I didn't know any better. And so I, you know, spent, you know, millions of dollars, you know, helping to support, you know, nonprofits get these research studies done, you know, so I, I just, I just, I think it's important, you know, for people out there, whoever might listen to this, sometimes people see someone at a certain point, they think, oh, it just was this really linear thing. And they just got this point of success, but really there's a lot of trial and a lot of error. And so I always think it's important to just acknowledge that. Um, so your, I'm sorry, tell me again what your question was, Antoine, I apologize. I lost my no, train. No, it's totally fine. How has your experience as a principal at Finger really helped you in the field of work that you're doing now in philanthropy? Yeah, you know, Finger is in the DNA of Chicago Beyond. Like, you know, I, whether it's decisions that I make or the philosophical, philosophical principles by which we operate and our values are really all rooted in Finger, whether it's our value of urgency of like, you know, understanding that, you know, we don't have time to just navel gaze. We need to be able to, you know, make decisions, move resources out to people, uh, you know, value people's voice. Like all of those things are really rooted in my experience of at, at Finger. Um, I think, I actually think, as I think about philanthropy as a whole, you know, what would happen if instead of, you know, people who are, you know, not proximate to community, what, what if instead people ran foundations or who, or were program officers who actually had experience with the community? How, how would decisions, you know, be different? How would timelines move? Like, you know, how would we really think about this type of work? So it's, it's in the fabric of everything that we do at Finger, you know, I mean, at, at Chicago Beyond. Kind of piggybacking off of Anton's question, I, I see your principal 
life and some of your assumptions there about easy metrics. School systems are sometimes driven by the, the metrics that are easiest to gather. Um, and also just trying to find uh, the perfect answer instead of doing what's important. I thought that was a, educators have to deal with messiness every day. There's, you're, you're never perfect as an educator on any given class or any given day. So I, I saw that. How is that playing out in your philanthropy? And, and, and give us an example of, of a couple of projects you're supporting that you think are just, are, are driving some, some interesting change. Yeah, so uh, you know, you you raise a really interesting point that we wrote about in the whole philanthropy, which is just that this it's like you know the most important insights are not always easily measurable, and I, th it's not just philanthropy; it is just how we're set up as a society. We wanna we wanna measure things. We wanna be able to count things. We wanna be able to show like because of this, then this, and I get that. Right. Like, you know, particularly in philanthropy, like we as an organization, we as philanthropists overall are responsible for stewarding resources. And that's that's no small task. Like, you know, it's not it's not something to be taken lightly and or, or willy nilly. But we also try to realize and begin with this idea of, you know, questions. Um, there's other there's other measures, right? There's stories, there's signals, there's there's other like data available that actually gets us to a more full picture of you know if we are actually successful in what we're trying to do. That sometimes numbers just they just they just can't get to you know, like it's easy to count and say like you know this number of young people got this program or you know this number of young people received this particular. Um, uh, service or good or whatever it is, but it becomes harder to really talk about. So what does it actually mean? You know, and it, it, it becomes even harder when, you know, you get into programs that have to deal with, um, you know, uh, you know, or that are therapeutic or that, um, are, you know, about self-esteem or that, you know, root children in their own like cultural identity and build strength and character within that. Like it, it's hard to like, what does it actually mean in the end? You know, what is, what actually happens as a result of that? And we just thought it was really important to, to call that out. I think there's a couple of quick examples I'll give you of that. Um, uh, so one, we support a program called Solutions and Resources. Um, it's run by a fantastic gentleman named Donovan uh, Price. Uh, if you don't know about Solutions and Resources, you should definitely look it up. Um, but Donovan started this work about, I think it was close to almost like five years ago now, where you know he was a, you know, a reverend, a pastor in the community, and just saw a need to be present and to show up uh, when people were shot. And he now is all over the city and he shows up when people are shot and, and or killed and just tries to be present with families and to help them and to begin on their healing journey. He saw a need. Um, and I've seen it too as a principal and unfortunately have known, um, you know, way too many young people that have died. And I've been on the scenes when they've died. I've sat with kids in hospitals as, as they've, um, died. I've also sat in hospitals with kids who have, you know, been shot and recovered. What I'll tell you about that time is like it's, it's a super fragile time. Like there's a, there's a traumatic event that has happened, and there's not often times like these. It's not, it's not like a, a service you call that comes on the scene that then does X. You know, yeah. families are often left to have to figure out what to do next, whether that means um, you know burial type of things or whether it means like healing type of social, like, you know, emotional things, or whether it means like, how do I get my glass fix uh, from my, you know, front porch window that's just been like blown out? Like what happens here? There's bullets in my home, what do I do? And Donovan, you know, does that. So he literally goes around the city and helps people do just that. He prays with people, right? I mean, all types of things. And, you know, how do I, how do you measure that? Yeah. What do you say? Do you say he went to, you know, 400 uh, situations like I, what I was describing last year? That's what he did. I mean, do you say, is that how you measure it? Do you say that, you know, because he sat with a family and prayed with them, that led to what? 
is, I mean, do you mm -hmm. say that? I mean, like, what do you say? And so the, the, the point of why I thought that was so important and wanted to include that in whole philanthropy is because I think it's, it's these type of stories and these type of real life, real people things that cannot be measured by a randomized control trial. And they, they can't be measured by some data point, but they actually matter. And I know they matter because, you know, for me, I, you know, I'm in philanthropy now, but, you know, I've sat at that scene with the, with a, with a person who's just lost their child and, and, and they, and they need what Donovan is bringing and it does bring some type of healing, but I can't measure how much healing it's going to bring. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like a, yeah. it's not like a counting type of thing. And so we just thought it was important to call out these type of, um, situations and for to try to raise awareness uh, for philanthropists to understand that, you know, you're not just going to always invest in the things that have the randomized controlled trial, but you have to invest in the things that make com that are common sense too. And, you know, Donovan, what he's doing, it's just common sense. So. Yeah. And I, you know, what I see, I'm not going to go into all six of these things. I just got to encourage people who watch this to read the whole philanthropy I, you end on your number six point is to measure the messy and complex. And I think your story about uh, Donovan's work is like, that's just messy, hard, complex, needed work, right? And if, if you want to do things neat and clean in philanthropy, uh, you're going to avoid a lot of the hardest stuff, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, and it's this idea that somehow in philanthropy, like we have to be risk averse. There can't be too much risk. You know, we can't invest yeah. in things risky. And, you know, to me, it's a lot of times that's like code word for, you know, not wanting to um, invest in communities or invest in black and brown people. Because when you think about risk and I think about whether it's you know the idea of an Airbnb. I mean you think about you go back, you know, 15 years or so, you know, who would ever think we'd be like paying us, you know, sleep in a stranger's house or riding <laughs> a car. I mean it just wouldn't have been that was a risky you know proposition when wow. you think about when it first got started. I mean it, 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 you think of all the things how it would have gone wrong. But there was there was a chance that this could succeed and be a thing. And so I think that when it comes to philanthropy, somehow we don't want to take risks, you know, but that is inherently our job is to take risks. Like people's lives are literally on the line, like, you know, whether they take one path or another. And so that's our, it's, it's our job um, to take risk and really uncover that, you know, riskiness for what it is a lot of times, just being driven by other factors. Liz, do you think I, that, that is, sorry to cut you off, Brian, but I want to get this, I want to spit this question out before I forget. Um, do you think that that is one of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to philanthropy work. And if not, uh, what do you think is uh, one of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to philanthropy work? Uh, Antoine, do you mean like the idea of riskiness being the biggest yes. thing? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I think it's a combination of that and a few other things. Um, um, so I, this was in the summer of 2020, I had, a foundation leader, a U.S. foundation leader, call me, and this person said, "You know, Liz, I want to make an investment in Chicago, uh, and I want to invest in Black leaders, but you know, I don't know what to do because there's only this person, this person, this person, and and the person I was talking to named three people." And so I said to the person, I was like, oh, that's interesting you say that because I know this person, this person, this person, this person. And actually, we have a whole list of other people that you could you could consider for this. And so I think that, you know, it's a combination of, you know, this over indexing on risk and what really the undercurrent of that is a lot of times in terms of uh, our own perceptions around black and brown people. But then it's also this idea there's that there's like a limited number of, you know, black and brown people that we can actually like invest in that are good people that are actually gonna steward the, the resources well. And this is not true. You know, it's, 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 it's fundamentally not true. And so I think our role at Chicago Beyond, what we've been trying to do through some of our rapid response work, through our healing fund, through the investments that we've been making, is to showcase that. We're actually going to announce uh, in the next couple of weeks a concept we've been working on called Abundance. And we're announcing it with the MacArthur Foundation as well as the Grand Victoria Foundation. And it, and it really seeks to... Uh, 
turn that idea upside down, uh, the idea that there's only a few black organizations you can really invest in, but that there are an abundant number of them and we need to do a better job of seeking them out and not just making these like small thousand dollar, five thousand dollar contributions, but really make large scale contributions to uh, our work. Similar to, you know, when you think about Airbnb and, and Lyft yeah. and Uber and all those folks, how people, you know, bet on those ideas to, to really be successful. It's so funny to me that you, the venture capitalists will throw millions at a, a, a kid who can code a little bit and they, they're fine with nine out of 10 failing, right? But in philanthropy, we're like, ah, every dollar's got to be perfect, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's not, it's not logical, you know. It, it's, 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 it's not going to be a one-to-one -one correlation. I always tell my team that. And I tell my, I've told my team many times, like, if we're not failing, that's an actual problem. Like, we should. There are some things that we should be doing that actually don't work themselves out. And if everything works itself out, we have to really take a look at. Our process, you know, what is our, how, how are we, how, what, you know, what are we missing here? Because everything can't work out. It means we're being too tight. You know, we're being, we're not like letting like real ideas through. So. I know Antoine has some rapid fire questions. I have one, one question that hit me when it is, I love the partnership. I love everything you're doing on the, on oh, your, your thanks, strategy Brian. here. So I'm just, Thank I'm you. a fan. I, I think the one hard thing I'd say is, uh, as someone who, who sits on a lot of privilege, gender, race, et cetera, uh, it, class is a big issue. And can you, you have the money. So on some level, there is a class question as someone who always sat across the table from philanthropy. And it was, sometimes I could form an effective partnership, but that class issue was always so present in some sense. We were chasing the money, trying to survive and you had the money and and sometimes we could get past it but it always felt like it was a question in the air and how how do you deal with that that sort of classism within the philanthropy nonprofit world yeah we've actually called it out we called it out in um why am i always being researched we kind of touch on it and definitely in in whole philanthropy and in the document and, and guidebook we're getting ready to release titled Abundance, we come face to face with it and call it out for what it is and really try to call in a new way of working together between nonprofits and philanthropists with the idea that you know, we should each be on equal footing and we can't exist as if somehow, you know, if you have a degree or if you're a researcher, you then sit up here and everybody else sits at the bottom and these you know, folks up here at the top tell these people what to do because they're somehow more valid, smarter, whatever the thing might be. But really that we should all be working, you know, we should essentially be working together hand in hand. You know, and even though Chicago Beyond has had that philosophy since its inception, it's hard. Like I can, there's a particular organization that we funded and you know, I had worked with this organization for years, like years as, as a principal and um, really wanted to support their work when I started Chicago Beyond because I knew what it did for kids. And I can remember talking to the folks at the program in particular one of their leaders and was telling them, you know, this, you know, seven figure, you know, million dollar plus investment was coming. And, you know, I remember the person saying to me, well, what do you want me to do or what do you want me to do with it? And I was like, no, what do you want to do with it? And he was like, no, but what do you <laughs> yeah. want me to do? And I'm like, no, no, what do you want to do? And <laughs> two months of this, like back and forth, the, the, the gist of the question was for him was like, what do you want me to do? And I was like, no, what do you want to do? You know, and he said like all different iterations of that. But it was really hard for him, you know, to comprehend how could we be getting resources without someone telling us what to do with it, you know? Yeah. And the idea in my mind was like, you know, I trust you. Let's sit down at the table and let's, we can, we can figure it out together. But you as the practitioner are the guide, you know, like just because we're writing a large check doesn't mean that we understand what's best to do with the kids that you serve, that you see every single day. And so I think it takes that, to answer your question, I really think it takes a recognition of the power dynamics that exist. And as a philanthropist, it really takes, um, you know, the patience to show up in a way that is, um, you know, rooted in uh, community centeredness and rooted in, in solidarity, you know. 
That makes a lot of sense. We're going a little over time. Can we hit you with a couple quick hits? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So first and foremost, thank you so much for being our very first guest. This has been absolutely awesome. Once again, we want to make sure we give individuals like yourself and everybody moving forward their roses for doing such amazing work here in the Chicagoland area. It is so important and so crucial that we spotlight uh, individuals such as yourself, Liz. Uh, continue to do the work that you've been doing. Like I said, you have been a, a absolute sunshine in the field of all the craziness that's been going on at Finger throughout these past years. Um, thank you so much. Before we get out of here, we want to end on something lighthearted. Yes, very, let's do it. Very, very in-depth conversation. So I'm going to throw a couple questions out at you. And okay. you just go ahead and shoot as you go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Cubs or White Sox? White Sox all day, every day. Uncle Remy's or Harold's? Dang, <laughs> Harold. Harold, okay. Chicago style pizza or Chicago style hot dog? Oh. <laughs> Dang, I'll, I'll go hot dogs. Even though I don't really mess with hot dogs, but I really like yeah. New York style pizza. Don't tell anybody, but. You know. <laughs> okay, leave your drink, leave your drink in my heart. I got to put it to merit on you. And then last thing, what is the most underrated place to visit in Chicago? The most underrated places, places that people usually don't think about when they come come to visit Chicago. Oh my God. Okay, so I can't, I don't know what the exact, what the place, what you'd call it, but it's like, you know how when you're coming down Lakeshore Drive, so you're coming from south and you're going into downtown mm -hmm. and you're driving down Lakeshore Drive and you can see like the, you're driving north. So you're like right around, like I'd say, like you know, 35th, 55th, like right in that pocket. And you can mm -hmm. see the city in the background. Like I just uh, think in the foreground, I just think that is just the most iconic, beautiful, like people just don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, unless you know, you know, like it's just, it's just, it's just a beautiful, it just showcases all the beauty of our city. You know what I'm saying? From the South side. So. Are we talking it. daytime or nighttime? I think it looks great daytime and nighttime, but if I had to pick a time to see it, I feel like it's in the uh, definitely in the daytime. Uh, Brian, any last last comments? No, I'm just. It's so fun to spend time with you, Liz, and just keep oh, keep you. keep pushing, keep pushing your envelopes. I'm I love what cheerleading from the side. Oh, and thank you, Brian. We can do to help. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Antoine. It was so fun to be in conversation with you guys today. Yes, yes. Ladies, the time. Here, how can people uh, get informed with Chicago Beyond? Yes, they can go to chicagobeyond.org and they can, you know, from there, go on to all our social sites, you know, our Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all our things, as well as just learn more about Chicago Beyond at our website, chicagobeyond.org. All right. Thanks Ryan, so not bad for first show, yeah. Yay. Have a you beautiful did. day, Liz. You did, you did your thing. It was good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for your time. Continue to do the amazing work. And once again, we're giving you your rose. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Right back at you guys. Take care.